Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone from wherever you are tuning in across the globe. Welcome to our lecture. We are so glad to have you this afternoon. We'll give just a moment for everyone to filter in to our virtual waiting room or lecture from the waiting room. And we'll get started. Okay. So as everyone is uh, getting seated, set up, we can go ahead and begin. So thank you for joining us for RC's special lecture today, Conservation at Conti Temple, the 2021-2022 season with Dr. Nicholas Warner. I'm Lisa Gradici, RC's US Director. And before we jump in, I wanna share just a few brief updates. Um, as you know, our Tut Centennial Chapter Tour will continue this fall with Dr. Bre Betsy Bryan uh, presenting her talk, and we will be coming to Chicago, Kansas City, Dallas, and Atlanta. So admission is free, open to the public. We hope to see you there, but you must register, and you can find the dates, times, and registration on the rc.org website. And also, uh, while this fall, our Tut themed member tour is currently sold out. There are still spots available for the Grand Tour of Egypt to be held in March with Dr. Emily Teeter. Uh, we do anticipate this tour to sell out as well. So if you are interested um, in going, please visit again, rc.org or email Becca Atoll, um, whose information is on our website. So now we will turn to our subject for today's lecture, Kansu Temple. As you know, Kansu Temple is situated within the Southwest area of the Karnak Temple complex on Luxor's East Bank and is an ex excellent example of a small but complete new kingdom temple. So Kansu Temple has some of the best preserved and most vivid relief carvings at Karnak, which were long hidden under centuries of smoke and grime. And back in 2006, between 2006 and 2018, RC oversaw and executed the conservation and documentation work in the temple with the training of 59 conservators from the Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities. Uh, then this was completed with funding from uh, USAID. In addition to cleaning and conserving the six chapels inside the temple and two of the external facades, the project included structural repairs to stabilize the monument, photographic documentation, and a training school for the Luxor, Luxor Expectorate and the introduction of new visitor information and signage. But again, in 2020, RC prioritized the completion of the conservation work at this major monument starting in the fall of 2021 with full documentation using 3D laser scanning, which you will see more of today. And last year, thanks to your generosity, we raised $20,000 to be able to complete this past season's project. We truly work our, in partnership with all of our friends and members to complete this important work, we could not do it without you. So the purpose of today's lecture is to update all of you who so generously contributed to this project to so that you can see your philanthropy in action and continue taking this journey with us. And uh, Dr. Nicholas Warner, of course, RC's Director of Cultural Heritage Projects led the team. So Dr. Nicholas Warner is an architect and architectural historian trained at Cambridge and the Graduate School of Design at Harvard. He's lived in Egypt since 1993, where he's participated in and directed numerous projects related to the documentation, preservation, and presentation of heritage sites from all periods. We were very lucky to have him join RC as our Cultural Heritage Projects Director in 2020, and he's currently responsible for all of the conservation work at the Red Monastery, Ikhwat Yusuf, Carter House, which many of you heard about a few weeks ago, and of course, what we are here to learn today, uh, more about Kansu Temple. So thank you so much, all of you, for being here, and now I'll turn it over to Dr. Nicholas Warner. Thank you very much, Lieske, for that uh, introduction. Um, very kind of you. And I should say that although I have worked in Egypt for a very, very long time, 
uh, this is the first temple project that I have ever uh, tackled from a conservation point of view. Um, and it's both a great privilege and a great responsibility to be working on something of this scale um, and complexity. And I'm hoping to share with you some of the challenges that we have had uh, in the past year and also to share with you what is hopefully going to happen in coming campaigns. So for those of you who are possibly unaware of where this temple is located. It is, as Liska has said, um, if I can get my button to work. Uh, we seem to have missed out on a few slides. It's located in the southern section of, um, of Karnak Temple, um, and it is actually um, a building which um, is built entirely out of blocks from other uh, temples. We'll come back to that. This project, of course, I should say at the outset, would not be possible without uh, the close cooperation of our colleagues in the Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities. Um, and I would very much like to thank personally Dr. Mustafa Waziri, um, the Secretary General of the Supreme Council of Antiquities, uh, and Dr. Fatih Yassin, uh, Mohammed Abdelbadir, and Mustafa Osoraya, all of whom are based in Luxor. And it's only through um, a process of collaboration that such projects can successfully be accomplished. It's also um, impossible to accomplish such projects without the generous um, sponsorship of, of people, many of whom I hope are listening to this lecture tonight, um, our donors around the world, um, as well as uh, institutional um, givers. So a big thank you to all those who've contributed to the work that we've done so far. Here is a reconstruction showing, in fact, the location um, of Kansu um, in the southwest corner of Karnak Temple, um, facing the Avenue of Sphinxes that was recently opened uh, to the public in November that connects Karnak to Luxor Temple to the south. So one thing I always like to stress uh, to visitors to the site um, and in lectures is that although we are there visiting this place uh, and we sort of regard the landscape as being a landscape that is, has been there forever. One must always remember that there are a thousand years that separate, in fact, the construction date of Konsu Temple from its Ptolemaic neighbors, the Opet Temple and the um, massive gateway of, of Euergetes to the south. So this is an enormous span of time, in fact, um, almost inconceivable um, to us uh, in our present civilization, uh, but of course it is a reminder of the length, the longevity of ancient Egyptian um, culture. And the only blot on the horizon as far as I'm concerned is the storage magazine um, constructed by the University of Pennsylvania in 1957, which remains one of my key objectives to remove, as I will explain later on in the lecture. The temple is a remarkable thing because it's entirely built from reused sandstone blocks, many of which were brought over to the East Bank from the West. So we have blocks from, for example, the Temple of Tutankhamun now destroyed um, quite close to the inspectorate um, uh, on the West Bank. Um, and all of the blocks are reused, which is a phenomenal thing to me as an architect. Um, RC has been working, as Liska has pointed out, since 2006. She said, in fact, it is, I think she is right, it is six, but I only really have the records going back to 2008. Um, so uh, the work was focused on cleaning of surfaces um, and particularly the polychrome surfaces inside uh, the chapels. Not all of the chapels were conserved. Um, there are a good number that are still awaiting treatment. Um, but I decided at the outset of the project in the planning process that we would put off the polychromy for as long as possible, the conservation of the um, paintings, and concentrate much more on a lot of the major structural issues that we have to deal with in the conservation of this large stone building. So uh, in the new conservation plan um, that I drew up, uh, we decided that the first thing to be tackled was the roof. Um, the roof surface needed complete repointing of all of the joints on the roof and the consolidation of the limestone of the sandstone slabs, many of which are eroding. Uh, you can see here, if you look um, 
closely at the center of the screen, uh, you'll see, if you go very close, you can see uh, some of the graffiti of feet, which um, have been studied and published by um, Helene Jacquet, uh, which is an extraordinary collection of many, many graffiti um, on the surface of this roof. So that uh, objective is also extends, the roof also extends to treating the vertical surfaces of the, of the drop downs um, that we have between the main court of the temple, the succeeding hyperstyle hall and the um, rooms at the back of the temple. So all of these vertical surfaces have to be um, also treated. The other main target of the, um, of the outset of this campaign was the conservation of the pylon the major, major conservation problem, <clears throat> which was evident in the 19th century following the clearance of the temple from surrounding debris, um, revealed a, a very massively eroded base uh, due to uh, water damage and possibly theft of blocks which are, um, were reused um, in villages or by other people through time. Not all of it necessarily is due to water damage. Um, so uh, what happened subsequently um, was that at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, uh, Georges Legrand, he uh, blocked up the um, missing sections of the eroded sandstone at the bottom with a red brick and cement infill, which was then plastered. So more or less everything below the level of that white line that you see there. And we determined that it would be a necessity from a conservation point of view to actually remove this very hard impervious fill and um, to reinstate a limestone, um, uh, sorry, sandstone um, finish on the outside of the building. Before any of that physical work um, started, however, um, I uh, was very lucky to have my usual collaborators from CPT studio in Rome um, led by Pietro Gaspari to carry out the full documentation, 3D documentation of the temple, something that had never actually been done before. And this was carried out through uh, the combination of a variety of techniques, three techniques. One was pole photography uh, or photography um, in the upper areas using a, a, a pole, a telescopic pole, which could be raised to a staggering height of 14 meters. Um, it is not possible to um, to use a drone to capture data in Egypt. Um, and so we have to resort to other techniques in order to create um, the, the data that we need to construct this 3D uh, model of the, of the temple. Um, in addition to, of course, the photography, there was um, laser scanning using a Faro laser scanner, which you see on the right. And uh, the data was tied together with a topographic survey with um, a turtle station that you see here on the roof of the temple. I'm just going to show you now um, one of the outputs from the 3D scanning, which um, is a, a model, as you can see, um, of the temple. And this um, is a high resolution model um, without any doubt. Um, and uh, it gives us an opportunity to just introduce people also to the the, the temple in the round if they're not able to visit it themselves. So it is actually, I think, quite a useful um, publicity tool as well as um, an informative and important tool for conservators, as you will see very soon. We're also going to show you now, um, we're going to go through the Uergetes Gate from the Avenue of Sphinxes. This is the approach directly from the south. Um, and you can see here the facade of the temple with the missing um, structures uh, indicated by the column bases at the front. I don't know when these disappeared. Um, so this obviously the scanning was done before we did any work, um, but it was done at the time of the celebrations of the um, opening of the uh, Sphinx Avenue to Luxor Temple. So we had to clear off quite a lot of debris in order to be able to get back to the original structure in some cases. Sorry, this bit's a bit dark and gloomy, um, but obviously one can actually remove walls from this model. So you can actually look in um, places that you wouldn't be able to see views otherwise. This is the um, main court, um, which is about one third cleaned, maybe even a quarter cleaned in the previous campaigns. 
This is a lateral view of the hyperstyle hall um, looking to the east. And these are views of some of the chapels um, which have been completed in previous um, conservation efforts by RC. Um, so you can see the standard of the, of the polychromy is still amazingly good in many of these chapels, despite the fact that um, the temple was reused in the medieval period and later um, for stables, for dwellings. And uh, so therefore, you know, it's surprising that some of these chapels have survived as well as they have. And that is um, a cutaway um, axonometric showing the structure of the temple. So I've just shown you quickly the 3D outputs, but um, for me as, a, as an architect, um, the 2D outputs, both uh, orthophotographic and um, CAD outputs are of extreme use in, in doing anything to do with the temple in planning terms um, and in, um, in recording terms. So here's one of my favorites, which is a section through the pylon itself. Um, this is the first time that um, this has been recorded in any detail, I should add. Um, and so you can see uh, very clearly the structure of, of, that, of that pylon. Um, and this is photographs showing what, we, what the section is taking through the staircase um, through the middle, which contains, of course, vast number of graffiti, reused blocks, um, uh, some of which I think most of which was recorded by um, Helene Jacquet. These are uh, elevations, the east elevations and west elevations. The, the drawing at the top um, is actually a blow up of the central section, the central west elevation, which is at the larger scale. And it shows the area that is currently completely enclosed by the um, Talatap block store uh, built by the University of Pennsylvania in 1957. This is a section of the building that is uh, as yet completely unrestored. And you can see on the inside, uh, there's still these rather nasty textured cement fills um, that are um, a characteristic of that elevation of the building. Sections of the staircase to the roof um, was very alarming when uh, it was revealed that some of the blocks on the temple on the staircase roof had eroded almost to the point of collapse. This was a serious matter. This remains a serious matter, um, and you can see here the erode, two eroded, severely eroded blocks on the temple staircase roof, which has now been covered over temporarily and propped with um, uh, structural propping. Um, so we hope to be able to do something about that next season. These are just sample sections which show you uh, quite clearly where you can see the conserved chapels and the unconserved areas um, that are still to do. The conservation program um, at the uh, temple is managed by our chief conservator, Theo Gare Anderson, um, who is a, a, has worked for RC on many occasions before, most notably during the um, campaign on Babzuela um, from 1999 onwards, or maybe around a little earlier than that, in fact. Um, so we're very fortunate to have such a skilled conservator, stone conservator, who is directing the course of this project for the next few years. And the first target, as I said, um, was the roof. So here we have an orthographic roof plan, which um, shows us where all the blocks are. Um, the reused sandstone blocks on the roof. And one of the main problems, of course, was getting up there. So this is where all the materials came up the side. We eventually had two towers for access to the roof um, and we were very also keen to protect uh, people working up there. Site safety is important to us. Um, so there are some huge voids which people can easily fall into if they're not being careful. Um, so we started then by cleaning out all of the joints um, very carefully and then embarking on a two-stage mortar fill for the joints. Um, you can see this in action here um, and uh, Theo designed these very lovely little uh, wooden floats or almost like irons for smoothing out the mortar fills and the wider joints. And here you can see, in addition to my own feet, um, the graffiti feet of um, the priests of the temple, many of them, and at the center, the sample finishing mortars. The mortars are actually mixed with stone powder and it took uh, quite a long time to get sufficient quantity of the right color powder to complete the whole job on the roof because we would quite like uh, uniformity in the 
um, in the jointing material, in the, in the mortar used in the um, pointing. A final stage of consolidation was, had to be carried out um, in extreme cases with ethyl silicate, um, where the surface of um, the stones were severely cracked or eroded. Um, and the last part of the, of the roof story is the installation of a series of sandstone plugs. I think there are about 40 of these sandstone plugs, which go into gaps in the roof that were originally uh, holes made to light the temple that came before Konsu, as it were. These blocks all came from another temple, but they were put up in an order that did not match the design of that earlier temple. So we have a random set of, of half uh, holes, as it were, which were originally lighting holes in the temple roof, which we felt was better to plug in order to stop um, possible water dripping down onto the decorated surfaces underneath. So these blocks were all carried up by hand. Here on the right, I'd like to introduce you to Haniel Taib, who is um, in charge of the uh, team working on the roof of the temple. And these are the, the sandstone blocks. Each one, of course, is different, carefully measured, carefully designed to fit its individual hole, and carefully made, too, um, by our master mason, James Wheeler, who is shown here um, in the stone working area that we set up um, near to the conservation lab, the RC conservation lab. Um, and here he is carving one of those stone plugs that you just saw. Uh, in addition to those, those rather geometrically shaped ones, we have uh, simpler, larger plugs that um, infills that had to be made in order to um, deal with some of the problems on, on the roof. Final thing on the roof was to repaint, or to paint, in fact, all of the structural steelwork that um, had been installed by our French predecessors, um, just as a, a method of, of prolonging their lifespan. Vertical surfaces, I mentioned that before. Um, you can see here, you know, the roof is not just a flat surface, horizontal surface, it is a vertical surface, and we um, also embarked on that. So uh, initially we started off with a target of just completing the roof over the main court. Um, but um, in fact, owing to the enlargement of the team that was working on it, we've now done, I would say, almost two thirds of the whole surface of the roof and we'll continue with that next season. This is our team and I hope that very many of these individuals will be able to join us again for the, the coming work in the next season. So fines, a little brief mention about fines. Um, it is an archeological site after all. So um, during the work of clearing and cleaning, um, Theo Geranson discovered um, at least five of these cone bread marks, which seem to have been placed deliberately by the masons on individual blocks of stone located at different points around the roof. And we also found one butterfly cramp in situ. On the left, you see um, a wall with all of the cramps that were originally wooden cramps. And so uh, this is one that is definitely in situ, the only one that we found so far. We also made some discoveries when we took off uh, large random blocks that have been sitting on the roof um, for no good reason, because well, for the good reason that they're very difficult to remove, you need a very large crane to get them off safely. So you can see here, one of these blocks coming off. Um, and when we took it off, it revealed a lovely little graffito. Of, if you look at the center, the pair of feet with implements on either side, which James Wheeler, our stonemason, immediately identified as a mallet on the right and chisels uh, for stoneworking on the left. So that was a rather nice reward after we'd removed that large block from the roof. We also removed a lot of random um, blocks from the chapel, roof chapel area, which is where you come up to um, from the staircase. And here again, we found is a Theo Garrison and um, Rice Mahmoud, our, our Rice, Rice Mahmoud Farouk, um, engaged in moving one of these blocks again from um, that area. And when that block was moved, we found um, an inscription uh, left by uh, Lepsius, um, I'm not sure, I think um, I'm reliably informed that there was a, um, uh, there is some faking going on, not only of ancient Egyptian antiquities, but the names of travelers, the graffiti of travelers are also known to have been faked. So I don't know if Lepsius in fact carved this himself, but I would like to think 
he did. Um, so that's a well, modern piece of graffiti. We also made some very interesting discoveries um, relating to the secondary use of the temple, um, probably from the medieval period. This is one kitchen that we discovered. There are about six altogether on the roof of the temple, as well as some industrial um, emplacements as well. Um, and we look forward to um, studying this phase of the life of the building in great detail in the future, because so far um, it has really not been attended to. Um, and it is a very interesting story, I think, that the, the building still has to tell us of that period of its life. Um, just to remind everybody that up until at least the 1920s, there was a very large village, not very large, a large-ish village next to the temple on the um, west side of the temple, um, and undoubtedly quite a lot of activity within the temple as well. Um, probably not by the beginning of the 20th century, but certainly I would say up until the middle of the 19th century. So to turn to our second target, um, the pylon, um, the area that uh, we focused on was uh, within that circle there. You can see here um, a front and back view of that half of the pylon, the east part, east half of the pylon. Um, and you can see a detail here um, of the uh, brickwork that was used to fill up the eroded areas um, and the flaking plaster that is on the surface, which indicates that there is um, water there behind. And indeed, when we took out some of the brick fills, as you can see here, you can see that in addition to the severely eroded uh, large blocks at the base of the pylon there, you can see the detail here of the powdering stone um, behind because essentially the, the fill material that was used, this very dense brick with um, cement mortar meant that uh, the fill was impervious. So any water uh, drawn up by hygroscopic action within the pylon um, causes the deterioration of the surface of the stonework within. So if you like, basically it's rotting from the inside. So this in a way was the um, final justification for the course of action that we had decided on a replacement of the of stone in place of the brick. So to do that, we of course had to go and have a look and find the stone, which proved to be one of the major difficulties of this campaign, getting enough stone of the right size um, from the quarries down in Aswan. This is partly because um, the Egyptian army has now um, purchased most of the stone quarries in Egypt, if not all. Um, so getting the stone was quite a challenge. Um, and here we are discussing what to do um, at the quarry phase, so to speak. So we did get um, a large number of stones. The difficulty, of course, is that we're dealing with stones that are over a meter in bed height. Uh, they're very large, uh, stones and um, to get these out of the quarry is um, a real test. So some of them have been shaped um, locally uh, that you see here, um, but others of course still need to be shaped. So the method for the pylon um, work of, of replacing the, the uh, brick fill with the with the sandstone was to cut back the decayed areas of stone uh, in order to be able to insert stones that were of structural quality. I mean, this is a real building which has to stand up and um, the blocks have to be big blocks. So you can see the first two blocks going in there um, uh, at the bottom of the picture and the ingenious mechanism for, for actually sliding the blocks into, situ in, into their location. Um, they're very heavy blocks, of course. Late on in the season, we had a, a discovery, which um, was, I think, a very favorable one for future, um, which is that uh, on the West Bank, um, we were told about the existence of a diamond wire saw. So we did carry out an experiment, a cutting experiment um, at, at uh, Konsu. Um, and this is a piece of equipment that um, we've set our heart on um, because it will certainly speed up the process of squaring up the large rough stones that we're getting from the quarry. So here we are, this is lifting one of those blocks into position using the crane. Um, access, of course, is difficult because in this case, because of the presence of um, the remains of a sphinx on the right-hand side of the image. So it's quite a difficult squeeze to get these blocks in here. 
and you see um, James Wheeler on the left finishing off the, um, the three blocks, the large three blocks that we got in there. Um, and then we've just filled up the top um, with a temporary fill of sandstone and lime mortar. Um, and that'll come out next season and we'll be able to finish this corner of the building, inshallah. So now I just want to um, mention a little bit about our plans for the future. One of the um, key problems that we have to deal with, uh, and I've alluded to it before, is the relocation of the University of Pennsylvania Talatat block store, which is a very shoddy structure, um, even um, to those who love it. Uh, it has almost certainly an asbestos roof, and it has um, a rather, uh, well, yes, shoddy <laughs> interior in which 16,000 blocks are stored. These are the Talatat block, the, the Talatat, some of the Talatat blocks of the Amana period. Um, and just to give you an idea of the quality of some of these blocks inside is, is high. And of course they're stored in a situation which is quite unsympathetic because um, they shouldn't be stacked um, 10 high as they are in some cases, um, but they need to be preserved in a slightly better way for the future, in a much better way for the future. Um, so we were fortunate to have the support of uh, Dr. Mustafa Waziri in our proposal to relocate the Talatat block store to the west of the temple, to an area that was um, occupied by, once by the enclosure wall of the temple, um, the thick enclosure wall going around the temple. Um, this area preserves some remains of, um, of the original facing of that wall on its eastern side, but on its western side, it has a new wall. And in the middle, it has um, a, a fill composed of, of the, the mud bricks of the, of the wall itself. So uh, in order to accommodate 16,000 blocks of, of the Talatat blocks in this space, we actually have to have a structure um, that is occupying the whole of the area marked in red um, and a two-story structure at that, which would be a steel frame structure clad in mud brick on the outside. So you won't actually see it as a steel frame structure, but it will be there. Something that um, I like to use steel because it is reversible. Um, uh, easily reversible systems of, of construction. And that is one of the principles that I think uh, architects should adhere to in uh, their approach to heritage sites. We must think of actually remove, being able to remove modern structures as easily as we can. So uh, the first stage of the work is going to be, as I said, the consolidation of the um, front face of this wall. Um, and we've had uh, 4,000 bricks made large size bricks made um, to commence that process. The wall was in fact, one of the, um, the convex and conve concave uh, paneled walls, um, giving the wavy appearance of the temple exterior um, on the outside. So we'll be looking forward to trying to replicate that pattern of bonding in the new repairs that we do. It's actually occupying the similar sort of location that the RC Conservation Lab off, uh, occupies it. As you can see, the blue uh, rectangle at the bottom is where the RC Conservation Lab is. And there are existing storerooms, also modern stores that have been built um, in the southwest corner of the enclosure wall where it was missing. So um, in a way, we're just continuing on the, the process of using the space of the missing wall for modern purposes. The other thing that we've got to deal with um, is structural conservation of, of many of the roofing slabs. We have um, three slabs in the main court and, and two in the um, staircase that need uh, fixing with stainless steel anchors. And the system that we um, are proposing to use is that um, of a company called Syntec who have worked at the temple before um, and they have been asked to come back and do this work which is a precision drilling work um, and the insertion of these stainless steel rods um, in sleeves, which are then grouted up with um, a proprietary grout uh, that will actually stop um, future 
structural failure. So that is something that is scheduled for January, February, March next year. We're also going to be carrying out um, a, a training project, which I hope will be led um, by uh, RC's president, David Anderson. Um, he did do a little course um, in um, digital recording um, at another project that um, I was working on earlier in this year. So we're looking to do an expanded version of that uh, course in January 2023, uh, which will have as its focus uh, a, a reconstruction digital reconstruction of the remains of the granite bark shrine that occupied the area ringed by the red oval at the rear of the temple. And many of the blocks, granite blocks from that, decorated blocks and undecorated blocks from that um, shrine, which was quarried um, and for reuse mostly, only some of it survives in situ. Um, and this is all going to be recorded. Some of them, of course, are extremely beautiful blocks. Um, and one of the reasons that I'm keen to do this project is also to figure out a way of treating this material in the future. So if it's possible to actually return some of it to its original location in a meaningful way, um, I think we might explore that option in the future. So that training project will um, continue RC's commitment towards training um, local conservators and local um, inspectors from uh, the Luxor area, at least. A major part of the work that will be new um, will be uh, the first season on polychrome surface conservation. And for that, we're going to actually continue on from where um, RC effectively left off uh, in 2015, in fact, um, with uh, this part of the temple. Uh, in the main court, um, the walls and six columns um, in this area. Uh, and that is uh, going to be led by Bianca Madden, um, the specialist plaster conservator. Then, as I've said, we will be continuing on with the program of stone replacement on the pylon, um, which is, I think, going to be speedier this year than last, since we now have the experience, we have, we have experience, whereas we didn't have experience before, now we have experience. So I think we um, are looking forward to being able to do a very serious part of the work on the Eastern part of the pylon. And we are also going to be getting a, a second Mason um, to assist in that project. The stone conservation on the roof, you've seen what's been going on so far. Um, and I have every expectation that we will be able to complete fully the conservation of uh, the entire surface of the roof, um, which is going to include also um, shelters in some cases to stop water penetration over chapel, missing chapel roofs, for example, or screens uh, made to prevent bats and birds from flying through uh, openings in the structure, which, um, which inevitably leads to soiling of the wall surfaces um, of, of, the, of the wall reliefs and polychrome surfaces. So that is an essential part of, of the program for the coming year. So that is all I think I need to say to you this evening. Um, and uh, I encourage everybody to visit us um, at Konsu if they're coming to Egypt. I'd be delighted to take you around. Um, and it's not just on the West Bank, I should say that we have balloons. Um, they do come over to the East Bank occasionally. Um, and uh, in the early morning, you can get some remarkable images such as this one, this photograph taken by Theo Gare Anderson at six o'clock one morning in Karnak. So if there are any questions now, I'm delighted to be able to answer them um, and try and explain if I've left out anything very major from um, this presentation. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Nicholas. And thank you to all of you um, again for being here today. I will get sorted. If everyone could just put their uh, questions, if you have not, if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A and we'll try and get through as many as we can. I um, had the good fortune myself to visit Konsu. I believe it was in about February and it was really wonderful. Um, so we hope that this lecture brings a little bit of that 
to you. And we want to make sure that we share our thanks and gratitude to all of our friends and members who made this project happen. RC does commit our own funds to our projects, but then we ask our donors and friends to help us to make these projects come to life. So I wanted to make sure that we said thank you to all of you um, for making this possible. The 3D scan that you saw that is amazing and has such wonderful implications for providing access points to people from across the globe was made possible by RC donors. So if you saw your gift in action and were pleased with what you saw today, please, Catherine will be putting a link in the chat. We ask you to invest in this project to keep the work going for the next season. We will also be sending a follow-up email and 100% of the donations that were made during our campaign last year and that uh, friends will make today go towards this work. And it's not just the important conservation work, but also the providing digital access and training the next generation uh, to carry on this type of work, as Nicholas mentioned, they'll be doing in the coming season. So I ask you to please consider reinvesting in Kansu Temple, and we will continue providing updates. Um, and with that, I will get to some questions for Nicholas. We'll try and get through as many as we can. Um, first one, Nicole would want to know, can you identify where the reused blocks are from uh, by the text? And is it possible that you have an idea of where the original buildings are that the blocks were taken from? The answer to that question is yes, uh, some identifications can certainly be made and have already been made, um, but I am not the right person to do those identifications because I'm not an Egyptologist and I can't read hieroglyphs, sadly. So um, uh, Dr. Ray uh, Johnson from um, Chicago House has been studying a lot of the material um, from this temple and I hope uh, will continue to study this material after his retirement this year. So he has already um, made a substantial number of identifications that he has, I think, shared in a lecture uh, last year, um, which I believe is probably on the RC website, perhaps. Um, yes. But it certainly was a recorded uh, lecture. So in that lecture, he does uh, identify a number of sites for um, the reused blocks, a source for the reused blocks. Sure. Thank you. Um, a question about some of the graffiti. Uh, are the chiseled feet on the roof, could they perhaps be a signature or of stage directions of where to stand during certain moments? And this person suggests potentially celestial observations. I don't think that they are stage directions. Um, I think that um, the majority of feet are they, they, the, the people carving the feet obviously try to choose the, the, the best surface in order to carve them on. Um, so they like to put them on a flat bit of stone that was relatively undamaged um, for a start. Uh, they are uh, in many cases um, identified as being the feet belonging to particular individuals. Um, and I can think of some of them that are priests of the temple so you have um, indeed generations of priests who are identified in the inscriptions that go with the feet. Um, and I'm not sure what the time range on those is, but uh, quite significant, I believe. And all of the graffiti, with the exception of things that we've uncovered by removing large blocks of stone sitting on the roof, um, are recorded um, in a wonderful publication, fascinating publication by Helen Jacquet. Um, which is part of the um, Oriental Institute of the University of Chicago's epigraphic series publications um, and is a really wonderful um, source and archive of material relating to the graffiti. Thank you. We've gotten several questions, Nicholas, about folks visiting Kansu. Is it open to the public? Some people have said they've uh, been able to access the, the chapels and some people have said they've found them locked. So for folks who will be there, perhaps not on an RC tour, what might they expect? Well, you can certainly visit the, um, the 
exterior of the building and the walk through the whole temple, getting access to the chapels is a bit of a hit and miss process. Um, uh, often, if you go with a, as an individual, you might find it difficult to get in to see the chapels. If you go with a tour leader, um, he will probably um, arrange with one of the gaffiers, one of the, the guards of the site um, to access um, a chapel. In the future, we are trying to go, implement, a, obviously, a, a policy of rotating which chapels are open to visitors, because I don't think it's a good idea if everybody goes uh, to see the same chapel all the time. Not good for the chapel, at least, not good for the polychrome um, paintings inside. So we will undoubtedly, in a future phase of, of work, be examining how to actually access those in a, in a realistic way. Um, and I hope that um, that process won't take too long to sort out, but until then, it's going to be, I'm afraid, um, a bit of a hit and miss thing, getting access to the um, polychrome chapels. Obviously, uh, if any of the RC staff are present at the time, we will offer you every assistance in getting in to see these things. Mm -hmm. Yes. And is it the same with the conservation lab that is there? Is that open to RC members or is that only if RC staff is there as well? Ah, well, the conservation lab, <clears throat> the toilets are one of the most precious things in South Karnak that are inside the RC conservation lab. And since the opening of the Avenue of Sphinxes, um, which oh, yeah. took place in November last year, um, the, the, the conservation lab has effectively become a major destination um, for everybody who's passing through that part of the site because there are no public toilets anywhere um, in the vicinity. So what I fail to say is that uh, I've also got permission along with the construction for the construction of the conservation of the Talatak block store. I've also got um, permission to construct a new set of public toilets, which are... Um, uh, in another area of the of the enclosure wall away from the lab um, because it's impossible for the RC laboratories to sustain um, visits by potentially hundreds of people every day um, um, with a system that is not linked to any mains sewerage. So all we have is a septic tank outside, um, which has to be emptied on a very regular basis. So. Um, it is my hope that in the future we'll be able to build a new set of toilets that is directly connected to the main sewage system, um, which will be a great benefit to everybody on site. The conservation lab itself, um, the actual lab part of it, uh, is off limits and by appointment only. Thank you. Um, we also have a few questions, I think, inspired by the 3D scan about using drones to kind of uh, do that work. Can you use drones in, generally in Egypt? Would this be something that is used? Talk to us about the use of drones. Several questions there, I think. Uh, you can't use drones. Uh, research uh, missions like ours, um, uh, foreign research missions, and Egyptian missions cannot use drones. They are um, prescribed by the government. Their use is prescribed by the government. Um, and indeed, as a tourist, you should not bring your drone with you uh, into Egypt because it will only lead to trouble. There is one company in Egypt um, that does carry out drone work um, but it's mostly for photography, for um, for videos and things like that. It's not of the level that we need um, for Konsu. So, uh, sadly, we're not we're not there yet in terms of the use of drones. It would have saved an awful lot of time and money if we had been able to use drones for um, the survey of the of the temple that you've seen today. Mm -hmm. And. Um, just to note that the survey of the temple will uh, eventually be available online um, and we'll be working to get that out and available. Of course, that's a large part of our shared mission is making sure that everyone has the opportunity to see uh, this documentation. Yes, and what you saw today was only, um, uh, I think, one minute 30 out of uh, a five minute long um, 3D uh, presentation. Um, and uh, RC is committed to putting these 
videos, not just for constant, but for other projects up online um, as fast as possible. So we will be doing that in the near future. Absolutely. Okay, we have time for a couple more questions quickly. Was there a special formulation of mortar needed to patch the roof joints since cement can chew away at stand, sandstone? You might have mentioned this. Well, I, I think I talked in last, last year's talk about the preparation of, um, of our line. We uh, slate line one year in advance of its use. Um, we go through about um, 40 tons a year. Um, so we have a large amount of, of line. There is a big lime slaking facility and, um, and the lime gains strength the longer that it is allowed to, to sit after it's um, been slaked. And then it's mixed with washed sand. So that is quite a challenge is washing the sand to remove impurities that are salt from the sand. Um, and then uh, stone powder, which is a sandstone powder uh, found to be the best um, mix for these fills, all of the fills. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And that answered another question, which was what kind of made up that concoction of the lime slate. Um, Matt would like to know, is there another solution for the Talatop blocks uh, other than st long-term storage? If, for example, a new temple. <laughs> Um, well, it's a difficult question because uh, there are lots of lots more Tilatap blocks, um, not just in this store, but in other stores um, outside Kanonek. Um, and there have been various projects to study them. The RC Tilatap, I mean, the, the blocks in the in the Pennsylvania store, these sixteen thousand blocks, um, you can look at them online. Um, they are, um, I think, um, part of the RC um, archive, uh, which is uh, viewable online. There are many more, as I said, Talatat blocks that uh, come from the interiors of, of pylons, usually. Um, and um, there are there is obviously the destroyed temple of, of Atem um, on the north side, and, sorry, on the on the west side, of, east side of Karnak, um, and in terms of rebuilding it, it would be a very, 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 very difficult jigsaw puzzle to even assemble a small wall of a temple from what is remaining, I think. Um, let's leave that one to the future, if you don't mind. And uh, thinking about the staircase that's there, I remember uh, going up that with you when we were there visiting. Um, Chris would like to know, will we have to replace the section of the staircase completely or is that being repaired? There are two roofing slabs which are undecorated um, that are over two meters long, 40 centimeters high and 60 centimeters wide, which we will aim to replace with new slabs if we can find material of the right dimensions. The interior of the staircase um, is in pretty good condition. It needs one or two blocks replaced on the stair um, to allow people to actually get up it without severe risk of, of, of falling. Um, I would personally quite like to make the staircase part of a visitor experience, um, of people going to the roof of the temple in a controlled way to study the view over Karnak um, to enjoy the view over Karnak from the roof chapel that you saw in some of the photographs in the presentation today. So uh, the staircase will, will be getting quite a lot of attention at different points in the project and it will have to be cleaned as well and pointed like everything mm -hmm. else. So um, I think that as an architectural experience and a visitor experience, it's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And we'll end with this one last question that I think lots of people are always curious about. Is it difficult to find the skilled workers to do this type of restoration? And how do you find these folks, you know, for example, the master mason that you've worked with, and how do you build uh, the team to be able to do this type of very important uh, and you know, meticulous restoration work? Well, there is always a balance between um, 
foreign conservators and local conservators in these projects. And um, the stonemasonry is an area, I would say, where um, our Egyptian colleagues have not developed the skills that are required to do um, very, very high quality stonemasonry replacements um, that we've seen going on here. Um, in other areas, um, they, uh, our Egyptian colleagues are extremely adept. And one of those areas um, is doing all of the work that you've seen, um, the fills and the, and the polychrome um, restoration as well. So Arsi was contributing to that story of training local conservators. Um, and many of the conservators who are um, working at Karnak, who have joined our team, have been working in other areas of Karnak for a long period of time as well, and have been trained on RC projects. So if you like, we are reaping now the benefits of, um, of a long process of investment in people that has started in 2008 um, and continued for a decade. So in that, in that case, we are very, very fortunate, I would say. Um, so we have a great team and I'm hoping that we can work with the same people. There is an issue which is uh, a difficult one to solve in terms of planning um, for these projects, which is that uh, there is a desire to rotate conservators through um, a conservation project like this. And I have absolutely no problem with that. It's the speed of rotation that is a difficulty because if you have to replace a team that you've been working with uh, every month or every two months, that's um, difficult to maintain a high out output because you have to get to know the new team um, and spend time with them. Um, and so it does slow down the work a bit. Yes, well, thank you. Well, I think that's all the questions we have time for today. Thank you for submitting all of your questions. We got through as many as we could, but I wanna extend on behalf of RC, uh, hearty thank you to all of you who supported Kansu Temple's conservation work um, for our last season. We'll look forward to keeping you updated on uh, the next season of field work and all of the things that Nicholas and his team um, will be doing there at Karnak. So thank you again to all of you who supported this project. Thank you to Nicholas for leading this project and such an incredible team, and also to uh, my colleague, Catherine Reed in the background. So if you have any questions, of course, you can reach any of us via email, uh, via our RC website. This lecture will um, in a few uh, shortly be up on the RC YouTube page and we will follow up uh, via email as well to let people know when it is ready. So thank you so much for all of you for being here today. And Nicholas, thank you for sharing your updates on a very big season. Thank you all. Take care. Thank you.